Everybody good? Thank you and good morning and welcome. I'm Susan Molinari. I'm Vice President of uh, Public and Government Affairs here at Google. And um, every once in a while, you get these special moments here working at Google where um, we get to take part in what is a really important conversation of what's happening in our world and our communities. And we get to work with some amazing people, most of whom are sitting in this room right now who are trying to make change. So I want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to begin a conversation on the urgent need for bail reform and also announce Google's new policy to ban bail bond ads from search. Applause. <laughs> thank you. And I only say that, and, and we'll introduce the people who really helped to make this happen here at Google. In any major institution, right, change is hard no matter um, the best arguments that you have. And so um, you're going to meet some of the heroes who um, went to Google and put forth all the data, all the numbers, um, quantitative, qualitative, um, told the stories of the lives um, that have been impacted by this issue um, in order to make this change. So I'm really proud to be standing up here with them. We're also really especially grateful to those NGOs and leaders who partnered with us on the issue of bail bond ads and our search products. We want to thank Color of Change, the SE Justice Group, Leadership Conference for Civil Rights, the Civil Rights Corps, RFK Human Rights, and Coke Industries. Thank you all for keeping this on the top of all of our conscience. So we're really grateful for your leadership in this. Thank you for your continued leadership and for helping craft a policy that will make vulnerable communities less vulnerable in their interactions with the criminal justice system. I look forward to hearing from many of you today on your work, the impact this decision might have, and how we can continue to be a good actor and raise more awareness about the human costs of mass incarceration and overcriminalization. So to kick off our event today, I want to um, thank David um, Graf and, and Malika um, Sadar-Sar um, for being here, you along with Adrian. Uh, round of applause for Adrian because she's not going to be on the stage. have played an instrumental role in making and pushing policy changes here at Google. I hope that these changes will demonstrate our commitment to being a good actor in this space. We are clear on the harm that the bail bond industry has had on vulnerable communities, and we will not accept revenue from their ads. Um, I'm also going to ask Malika when she comes up here. So this is just one part. Um, many of you know over the last few years, um, we've been putting out um, a video called Love Letters. And we do this beautiful video um, on, on YouTube of love letters um, of kids to their moms on Mother's Day and then um, kids to their dads on Father's Day. And this year, we're really um, going to be emphasizing particularly the mothers. And there's going to be an internal fundraiser um, at Google where Googlers can contribute um, to an effort to provide bail um, to those moms so that they can get out as soon as possible. So just a whole bunch of good things happening here um, because of all of you. So with that, I'm going to ask Malika and David to come take the stage and we begin our program. So honored to have everybody here today to celebrate, I think, what is a very powerful announcement. So uh, to make clear what that announcement is, I'm going to ask David, who, and you should describe what you do, because many of us who come out of the NGO communities don't always know who does what at Google. So if you can explain your role and then explain to us what exactly this decision is. Sure, happy to. And I would say many of us at Google don't always know what other people <laughs> at Google do, so, uh, so you're forgiven. Uh, my name is David Graff. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I am the director of the global product policy team at Google. And what the global product policy team does is we work very closely with our, par our product colleagues and engineers, um, working with them to sort of develop and articulate the underlying value proposition of products, the principles that guide their development, then the policies that govern how those products interact with users in the real world. Maybe a shorthand way of saying it is, or I like to tell people, that we work with the teams to sort of figure out what we should do when no one's looking, right? What are the right outcomes, right? Uh, if we were the only folks that were to know something was happening, would we be comfortable with that? And if so, why? And if not, why? So we can better refine our products and our policies over time. Um, with respect to this particular announcement, I'm, you know, I'm thrilled to say that you know, after, after working with a lot of folks in this room and hearing from our colleagues, uh, we rolled out a policy, a new ads policy, which essentially prohibits advertisements for bail bond services. And um, you know, we did so, and I, again, I want to thank my colleagues uh, Malika and Adrian, a colleague Michael Fagu, who's not here right now, 
um, for really driving the research around this. Uh, you folks know much better than I do, but we became convinced that these products were just sort of structurally unfair, right? Um, we have a, a history at Google, particularly on the ad side, of looking at ads products and ads verticals and seeing where we feel like the products are, are inherently predatory or structurally unfair. Um, we feel like we have, um, we're really committed to protecting users from harm and fraud and abuse, and also really committed to protecting users from products that are designed to capitalize on their sort of weakest or darkest or most troubling moments, and because we all have those in our, in our lives. And so this, this, uh, this policy announcement, I think, fits within a larger framework, and hopefully an ever-expanding and larger framework, um, of, of policies that we will roll out to, to protect communities. So before we go any further, I'm going to embarrass Adrian again. I don't know where she went, but if Adrian Biddings, who is back there, who's our legal counsel, I just really want to give Adrian a lot of recognition because she did all of the heavy lifting around this policy change. And, and it's important to recognize that kind of difficult everyday work that happens here at Google to make this kind of change. So again, to recognize Adrian, give her a big hand. So can you talk about uh, this decision that, that you have led on in terms of other decisions like predatory loans? And is there symmetry between what we've decided here around bail, bond ads, and the predatory loans. Uh, I definitely think there's there's symmetry. I mean, if you sort of pull back for a second, uh, a, a little over a year ago, we announced a policy that essentially prohibited advertisements for what we call payday loans or predatory loan products, right? And again, if you if you look at those products and you look at what we've done here, what you see is, are situations where, frankly, people are in desperate straits. They don't have a lot of options, and then they are presented with financing options um, that are. <laughs> structurally designed to keep them in debt cycles for extended periods of time, right? So whether or not, you know, you, you've got to make rent and you don't have access to traditional capital or a loved one is locked up and you are desperate, right? These products are designed to capitalize on that moment and then um, the research shows essentially trap people in cycles. And we had a lot of debates internally at, at Google and I'm sure those debates are similar to debates that other folks have around availability of, of financing um, to, to underserved communities and, and that it's important that there be good financing vehicles. But when we looked at, the, at these products and we, and we just did the research again provided by a lot of folks in this room, you know, we again came to the conclusion in this case as we did with predatory lending, as we've done with other financial products that are a little bit more uh, esoteric uh, like binary options. If you haven't heard of binary options, that's fine. Steer as far away from that as you, as you possibly can. Um, but these products, again, are designed to, uh, to really, again, to really trap people in, in uncomfortable cycles. And, and what's important to note is that when the issue around the predatory loans was brought to Google, was brought by the civil and human rights communities, and we responded. And what's important about this decision is that we reached out to the civil and human rights organizations, and we're really honored to be able to partner with them folks like SE Justice Group, Color of Change, the Leadership Council, to be able to really make this change uh, in partnership together in a manner that wasn't reactive, right. but proactive, which is absolutely critical. Um, so Susan, because of your leadership, we have really been able to engage the issue of justice reform, create a convening space around conversations on justice reform, and also use our different platforms around digital storytelling of the human costs right. of mass incarceration. So how do you see this decision as part of that overall effort in the last couple of years of engaging in justice reform? <clears throat> so um, first of all, again, thank you all for being here. Um, it has been an incredible honor to be working at Google as we have tried to use our platforms to tell the stories of those who have no voice or whose voices have been silenced. Um, you know, I, I inherently believe that people are good, and when they see injustice, um, they will react to it, but they need to see it. And for far too long, the criminal justice system, not unlike many years ago, um, domestic abuse, child abuse, all those, those stories that were sort of kept in the background, um, when, when they come to the public, when the public gets to see the narrative, the storytelling, the individuals who are trapped in jails 
because they can't afford bail for what their crimes were. Those are very different than the stories that we hear on the evening news or in the front page of the paper, right? And so if we can use the platform to tell those honest stories, to reach the American public to say, there is so much that is going on that if you knew about it, you would be unhappy and would call for change. And I think this is just another piece of us being able to, um, you know, we're all living in the system where the gatekeepers are going away, right? Um, and so, you know, the gatekeepers who tell the stories of, of some of the individuals who are behind bars because they are powerless in this society, because they are voiceless in this society. Um, because if it was any one of us, we would not be in jail, but they are because of that. If we can lend part of our platforms to their voice, if we can lend part of our platforms to their stories, I do believe that the American public will demand change. And I think that's just what we need to do to um, correct um, what has been you know, um, a trivialization of so many human lives and families um, that have been lost to this country. So um, I just see this as, a, as another step of um, getting us all to recognize that um, there's much that we can do. Um, I want to ask both of you, what do you feel the overall impact of this decision will be around justice reform, and what do you, what do you hope it to be? Uh, well, um, you know, we couldn't help but notice that, uh, that our colleagues at Facebook uh, did a fast follow, which was nice. Uh, so now we have the, uh, the two, and I mean that respectfully to the Facebook folks. Um, um, so it's nice that the, now both the large platforms have uh, have done this. Um, I think the impact is is twofold. I think there's a there's a very practical impact. Um, you know, from the Google perspective, obviously our, our our search product is popular, and I think that by not allowing these advertisements, right, that that does um, that does send a strong message, right, both a financial message to the people who are engaged in these practices, but I also think uh, the message is broader than that, right? It sends a signal that this is, it, it shines a light on an inherently unfair practice, right? It, um, it gives uh, other companies, I think, um, reason to think. I will say that after we announced um, our predatory loans policy uh, many moons ago, I won't name these companies, but I got a lot of emails from um, See, I should be fair. I think the emails were sent to Sundar, and then Sundar found, forwarded them to me. Um, but from CEOs of um, you know big companies saying this was really impressive. I'm glad you guys are doing this. This is something we'll look at doing as well, or we should think about these things. So I do think um, actions like this um, are important because of the immediate economic impact, but they're important because of the message they send. And and I, I do think that as we see the business community looks to see what other companies are doing, we look, right? Uh, other companies will look and that, that has impact beyond sort of the immediate, right, our immediate um, platform. Yeah, I, I think, uh, look, I, I think we are at a moment in time where we have individuals who are debating this in Congress, who are debating this in the White House, we are bringing together, you know, the, the, it always amazes me when we do these convenings how the political spectrum that can't agree on mostly anything in this town agree on this, that we are at a moment, that inflection point, where we were on domestic violence and child abuse years ago to deal with criminal justice reform. I think we are at that inflection point, and I think we need to run hard at it. We can lose it because, as we all know, other issues pop up, take the attention of people, um, but I, I do really believe that this is a moment where something like this has an immediate impact, it has a business impact, it does allow other businesses to engage, and it does highlight the inequity um, of, of the most fundamental um, of, of human um, aspects of living, an ability to you know, be found guilty <laughs> before one goes to jail or spends their time in jail, an ability for families to not be so... Um, exiled from one another, the ability to recognize the need to um, have someone who is incarcerated have a path towards a better life once they get out of jail. All these conversations that have not taken place, we are at that moment where we should be having those conversations. We should seize this. Um, and I think, you know, uh, bail bond has an immediate impact on those, but it also highlights um, the inequities in the system. It highlights the unfairness. It highlights um, 
you know, once again, sort of the structure of powerlessness and dehumanization um, that occurs whenever we have this conversation, which I again say, I just don't believe is what most people in America really want. So we wanted to take about five to seven minutes uh, for folks to pose any questions around how this policy uh, got done and how it's going to be implemented. So if folks have any questions around that, we really invite it because we want to make sure that there's clarity around what the policy is as well as the implementation. And we so have I have to, before, before we get to that, I also just want to say, and so Malika, you should take two seconds to discuss love letters because when we talk about this conversation, when we talk about this narrative, right, it's really kind of easy to just look at the numbers or, you know, read a front page of, you know, these are the people who are incarcerated right now and just skip to the next story because, you know what, it's painful, right? It's kind of painful to look and say, wow, this is still occurring in our country today. Love letters gives us that opportunity to showcase who are these individuals, to put that face, that voice. Um, and so when this comes out, I really hope that you will join us in, in getting as many people to watch and talk about what Love Letters is, because it's just done so beautifully, but you can't ignore it once you see it. So how can they just get more involved once this comes out? So, um, so Love Letters this year will be Love Letters from uh, Children of Incarcerated Mothers. And they are love letters that the children do to their mothers behind bars. What we were able to do this year is connect the different places of where mothers and children are. So part of love letters this year is with the mothers behind bars. Another part is with the children who have their moms behind bars. And then the final part is uh, love letters between mothers and children who have been reunited. Uh, it will be on the YouTube Spotlight page for Mother's Day and look out for it on Mother's Day uh, on the Google homepage as well. That, that is the plan. Um, we're honored to do this every year. Every year we do it with um, We Got Us, which is a powerful organization led by a child of an incarcerated father who works with other children of incarcerated. And we also work with Donna Hilton, who was formerly incarcerated and is a real leader in the movement to give voice and recognition to women and mothers behind bars. I also want to put out one more point of information, which is that we are, as of today, within Google, doing our best to support the Bail Out the Mamas campaign. So Googlers will be asked to support uh, the mothers who are behind bars to be able to bail them out for Mother's Day. And so that's an internal campaign uh, that we are doing within Google that we are really proud to do against the backdrop of this decision. Thank you. Uh, any questions from folks in the audience? I think we have a traveling mic um, about, again, the policy and the implementation. Yeah, I'll just have this out here. It's all clear. It's all clear. Can, can I? Now we'll, we'll keep saying. <laughs> Talk about implementation yeah. so folks know. Sure. So, um, so we announced this policy, obviously, yesterday. It won't go into effect for about 60 days. That's because we need to give advertisers notice. Uh, my legal colleagues require me to say that. We need to give our advertisers notice so they can plan. Uh, and then we will begin enforcing. Um, you know, enforcement is a tricky thing. Um, it gets better over time. Your uh, early months can be a little bit rocky as, um, I, I guess just to be completely candid, as people test the limits of your enforcement systems and see what they can do and see what they can they can get away with. I shouldn't sound so pejorative, but that's what happens. And so it will get better over time. Uh, I will say uh, that if you if you see something, uh, say something in the early days. Definitely let us know if you're seeing things that you think are not consistent with the policy. You very well may be, and uh, it's very helpful uh, for us to have that information so we can refine our enforcement mechanisms. Um, and I'll say one thing I wanted to stress, which is, so my team is about 50 people. It's globally dispersed uh, because our responsibility is for global product policy. Um, but we rely very, very heavily on organizations like the organizations you folks represent for research and for ideas and for spotting things in the marketplace and for spotting sort of products or services that you think are sort of inherently unfair or structurally unfair. We really, really, really do listen and I really just want to stress that it's very much an open door um, from, from the NGO community to Google to hear about those things. We may not always agree. I get that. Um, I'm told I can be difficult. But um, I, uh, I definitely, definitely, definitely appreciate the information 
on the perspective that everybody in this um, room brings. And so if you have ideas, if you have thoughts, please share them and please understand that we are extraordinarily receptive to, uh, to hearing and listening and learning. And so that means if tomorrow I Google, right, uh, something about bail, what will Maybe happen? Maybe don't do it tomorrow. <laughs> you won't see much of a difference until July, so 60 days. Um, so at I, some point in July. So just full disclosure, if you start Googling tomorrow, you'll see the same thing that you've, you've seen before. Um, hopefully, after July, you will start to see a market decrease right, in uh, the number of advertisements, right? Probably not zero, like I said before. I am hopeful, if you, if you promise not to hold me to this too much, usually what happens is it takes, takes a couple months, right, sort of, because we deal with very high volumes and we deal with people that are trying to test the limits. So, and admittedly, we have lots of stuff going on. So I think you'll see, starting in July or August, you'll see it taper off. I hope that by September, October, November, you're not seeing this stuff anymore. Again, I want to say, if you see it, please let, uh, please let Adrian know. Is she still here? <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll, we'll make sure that there's an email. Um, okay, we'll make sure that there's an email uh, that you can, uh, you can send uh, questions or comments to. So while folks are still thinking of questions, I thought I would just ask one that um, I've been getting a lot, and that is, um, and maybe this is because everyone here is already advocates and already knows the answer, but how will people find information about bail, um, and how will people get out of jail? Um, without access to the ads. So, so to be clear, right, if you, you can still get lots of information about uh, bail, bond services, and other information about bail in general by going to Google and by searching, and you'll see it in organic search rankings, right? Nothing on the, uh, we're not changing anything in the organic search rankings. So people looking for information will be able to get information, right, and get quality information because we are, you know, committed at Google to making sure that when you type in a search query, you get the most relevant responses, right? So hopefully that good information will surface. What they will not see are ads from companies that with with products that are that are problematic, right? And so there's still plenty of opportunity for folks to get quality information, right? Again, they just won't be they just won't see ads. And then we won't be part of that. We as Google won't be part of that economic transaction. We won't be facilitating that transaction, which is important. There's a question right over here. Hi there. Um, just a sort of background to understanding ads. Can you talk about how companies actually purchase ad space on Google and so how that will change uh, given the policy and then also where those ads appear? Or do they appear on Google and other sites just on Google? It's a great question. It's a great question to ask while David's here. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll keep this short. I won't give you my two hour lecture about how ads work. I don't think anybody wants to hear that. Um, so. Our research has shown that these, the ads for bail bond services primarily appear as search ads, which makes sense when you think about it because um, people are typing in search queries um, at a particular, particular point in their life, a particularly vulnerable point in their life. A loved one is locked up, so they might be typing in, well, how do I get my loved one out of jail or how do I get good bail bond services? So the majority of these ads really appear um, as search ads. So when you type in a query, if you typed in the, um, Sorry, I may be using Tech Talk, but when you type in words right on the on the on the Google platform, right, um, ads will come up, and so um, so by rolling out this policy starting in July, it'll be much harder for those ads to surface in response to queries that people type in. Um, so that's primarily where we're seeing this. We don't see as many. I would say the search page is one big place where you see ads. Uh, the other places you'll see, you could see display ads. So these are image ads. If you go to your favorite website, you see a bunch of ads on the page. Those are display ads, not search ads. We don't see as many, frankly, bail bonds ads, uh, bail bonds display ads. There are some. Um, those, are, those will be within scope of policy, right? So we will be taking action against those. Um, but, um, but for the most part, these ads are appearing, like I said, on the search page. Um, which is, which is good in a sense because that is a, that's a surface we obviously know well and it's a surface that we can, um, that I think we can, we can regulate very well. Uh, one last quick, quick question I saw over there. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, well I might not even need a mic. Um, <laughs> yes, so um, your uh, comment uh, raised a, or a question for myself. So you saw with your 
friend of me, Facebook, um, and the whole. Uh, I didn't say friend of me, just yeah. for the record. <laughs> uh, the whole fake news that happened last year, where they kind of switched gears and became kind of an educator in the space by partnering with NGOs and teaching folks um, how to spot and how to um, really consume news. Uh, do you see Google getting in that same sort of educational space by partnering with NGOs and not only providing an engine for people to find information, but also providing um, what we feel in the advocacy space is really the right information on how to really plan um, for your future and, and really set yourself up for uh, success financially? Um, any plans to educate or partner with NGOs? We are doing a, um, a last uh, couple of weeks ago, well, maybe it's probably a month ago now, we announced um, our news initiative, um, which is going to be global, which has a lot to do with how we're trying to um, deal with news. So, um, for example, in, in light of um, when there's a, 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 an emerging story where a lot of times the um, you know, the, the first things that might appear are the hoaxes or the untruths. And so, you know, we're doing things like saying for the first hour after, you know, a major incident, we're only going to rely and allow up on our sites those, you know, validated news services so that people who are immediately looking to see, you know, what's happening in light of a massive fire, a potential terrorist attack, et cetera, et cetera, that they're get actually getting from the, from the, the news itself. We are partnering with Stanford to figure out other ways that we can continue to work with the NGO community to make sure that we're getting out as much information as possible and teaching um, um, smaller outlets how to interact with larger platforms so that they can have a greater voice. Um, there's, oh gosh, there's a whole bunch of things that was part of our global news initiative in terms of making sure that we are providing um, the best, most sound information, as well as um, I think part of the work that we're doing with Stanford and some other universities have to do with um, educating people and sort of like uh, tapping into the res we, what we call the resilience so that when people do read things online that they have an ability to um, be more thoughtful about what may be true and what may not be true because sometimes we can't catch it all, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, we, we try and catch it, but it's a, it's a very active and interactive platforms, you know, between between what gets on and particularly on YouTube, what is it, 400 videos a minute? 400 hours of video every minute. 400 um, hours every minute. Moment, so right. think about trying to, and, and you don't want to mess with that, right? Like some of this stuff is so gorgeous and so great and so helpful. Um, that That's what this platform is. But at the same time, just like everything else, you know, there are people who try and, and work it. And so we do all we can to allow for, for the free speech, for the information, but also to make sure that in those critical moments um, that the right information is getting out to people. And, you know, that's just a, a you know, that's, that's, that's going to be, you know, a work in progress. And, and I just want to make sure you know that as we move into enforcement of this particular policy, our partnership uh, with the NGOs does not end. We will continue to work with the critical folks in this room who have helped us get to this point when we are at the, uh, the process of enforcement. Um, I just want to give thanks to the courage and vision of these two people with me and, and much gratitude for this decision that has been made uh, and invite Chanel, who has also been critical to uh, this policy change, to come up to the stage. And let me thank all of you again thank for you. Um, helping us get to this point. Again, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Chanel Hardy, and I uh, have the honor of uh, managing our policy partnerships with the civil and human rights community. I come from that community um, as well as the policy world, and so I really do feel like I'm among family today. Um, and I can't tell you how inspired we are to see the room this full uh, first thing on um, a Tuesday morning. Uh, so thank you for coming out. Um, it is my honor uh, today to introduce Vanita Gupta, who does not need uh, introduction, um, who was the president and CEO of the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights. Um, and for anyone who might not know, this is the nation's oldest and largest uh, civil and human rights coalition. Um, and so not only uh, does Vanita uh, have the opportunity to speak to the really powerful work that's been done um, by the bail reform advocates who have been really leading this time period, um, but also the, in many cases, more than a century of, of work 
um, that has really been uh, pushing forward, sometimes slowly, but always forward, the criminal justice reform movement and the movement to end mass incarceration. Um, and so I do um, want to acknowledge, of course, Sakira Cook, who leads the uh, criminal justice work um, for the Leadership Conference. Um, I see others here who have uh, issued supportive statements, like Ebony Riley at National Action Network, uh, Stephanie Mash Sykes at African American Mayors Association. We're so grateful. Um, as you probably know, Vanita, before she came to the uh, leadership conference, served as um, President Obama's head of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice, before that at the ACLU, and before that at the NAACP Legal Defense um, and Educational Fund. And all of these roles continue to push uh, the cause of criminal justice reform, and in many cases, bail reform specifically forward. So please join me um, in welcoming her to the stage this morning. Hi, good morning everyone. It is um, really exciting to be here on Chanel and Malika and the whole Google team and Susan. I know Susan, uh, Susan and her team, uh, I just think it's an extraordinary announcement uh, that you're making today and it's why I think so many of our groups have been sending out supportive statements because this is a big, big deal. And it's great to be in a room with so many advocates who've been working on these issues so tirelessly from across so many organizations. I, um, I'm really here just for a couple minutes to say that I applaud Google's move today. Uh, you know, civil rights advocates for a long time have been pushing off and upstream against uh, the kind of pop popular grain to try to ensure that low-income folks and communities of color are not criminalized simply because of their status of poverty or their race. And this is a big, big fight that is happening all over the country. And with today's announcement, Google's really said that it's not gonna profit from an unjust bail bond industry that essentially preys on poor folks and people of color. Because the bottom line is that in this country, nobody should be incarcerated uh, because before they've even been tried or convicted of a crime uh, because they can't afford not to be. Uh, and nobody should be going to jail because of debt. And in the last uh, several decades, despite falling crime rates, we've had over, there's about annually about 12 million people who go to our jails every year in local admissions. And that rate has doubled despite falling crime rates in recent years. And we have to understand why, and we have to understand the kind of for-profit incentives that keep people returning and into the system. It's a system that kind of self-perpetuates, and that's why it's so important that Google and other companies take the stand. But if Google's taking this leadership role, I have no doubt that other companies are going to be following suit. Um, we've got to understand, and we all do in this room that do this work every single day, that the unequal treatment of low-income people and people of color in the justice system is really one of the most profound civil rights issues of our day. It's why, despite, you know, sometimes, as I said, against all odds, we, we push and we fight for the dignity and humanity of everyone in our communities. And it undermines, the criminalization of poverty really undermines so much of the progress that we've made on a number of issues around racial justice and the like, because these are contemporary uh, models for how kind of Jim Crow has played out, and there have been a lot of authors and important advocates that have pointed out these connections. Brian Stevenson just most recently in the opening of the Lynching Museum in Montgomery, really connecting these dots in a really grueling and powerful way. But we've got to, we have to continue to shine a spotlight on the ways in which mass incarceration impacts uh, our communities. And increasingly, I will also say, and you heard this from Jeff Sessions yesterday, on immigrant communities as well, and the tearing apart of immigrant families where the for-profit motive uh, in uh, immigration detention is playing such a big role. So there's a movement afoot, and there are folks like Alec at Civil Rights Corps and Essie for Justice and Color of Change and civil rights and racial justice groups like NAN and the NAACP and the Leadership Conference and so many organizations, and once I start, there's like a whole panoply and I will get myself in trouble, but there is a movement afoot right now uh, to end money bail. Uh, and to end the criminalization of poverty. And I think we should just call it out that the money bail system itself is, is one that is diseased and needs to be ended. So our partnership requires the, the progress and bold stances of many in the ecosystem that is engaged in this work. And I think it's really important to lift up the advocacy um, of folks in this, in this room that are working in state and local communities to, to really turn this around and with companies like Google that take this kind of stand. So thank you. Uh, Google for listening to us when 
we as advocates bring these issues to you and we talk about the human stories of the men and women and children that are impacted by these, by these issues. And that I think working alongside advocates and legislators um, all over the country and most importantly with communities all over the country, I think Google's really taken an important step in protecting communities from predatory money bail practices. It's a step in the ecosystem. We all need to build on this movement and work together for dignity and justice and humanity in our justice system so that everyone can believe it uh, and everyone can have the benefit of living in safe communities where um, everyone is treated humanely because we have a long way to go on these issues. So thank you for your energy. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your commitment. Uh, and most importantly, we have a lot to fight for for justice in our system. Thank you. Hey, can I have SC Justice and Civil Rights Corps and Color Exchange come up to the stage? So I'm going to ask everyone to uh, introduce themselves, starting with Scott. Um, but before you all do introductions, I just want to make really clear that we would not be here today but for the vision, the advocacy, the warrior spirits of the NGOs and Mark of Coke Industries uh, with us on stage. They were absolutely critical in helping us to understand what we needed to do to ensure that this policy was a mindful policy and had a positive impact on the communities that we care so deeply about. Scott, do you want to begin with intros? Yeah, I'm, my name is Scott Roberts. I'm the Senior Director of Criminal Justice Campaigns at Color of Change. Color of Change is the nation's largest uh, digital organizing um, group working on behalf of black communities. Hi, my name is Gina Clayton. I'm the founder and executive director of SC Justice Group. We are a loving and powerful community of women with incarcerated loved ones, so the mothers, sisters, daughters, wives, and girlfriends behind bar, of, of people behind bars. Um, and I, myself, am a woman with an incarcerated loved one who's serving a 20-year sentence um, and come to, it from a, come to this issue from a deeply personal place, as well as a professional one. I, I before starting SC, was um, working in public defense in Harlem, uh, where I represented mostly mothers and grandmothers of people who were being um, uh, charged with crimes. And I saw over and over again in the lives of my clients um, the impact of, of bail um, and a whole host of other issues relating to the criminal justice system. I'm Alec Karakatsanis. I'm the founder and executive director of Civil Rights Corps, which is a small nonprofit organization here in Washington, DC that's dedicated to challenging the normalization of human caging in our society. And um, I guess after Color of Change and SE, probably the third greatest organization in the country, <laughs> um, just ahead of Google. Uh, Hi, I'm Mark Holden. I am uh, General Counsel, Senior Vice President at Coke Industries, also Chairman of the Board of Freedom Partners, on the Board of Americans for Prosperity, work in our seminar network with groups, really amazing groups like Charles Koch Institute, Charles Koch Foundation. Um, we are very focused on a lot of different issues, uh, all about breaking down barriers to opportunity. We are very focused on criminal justice reform and have been for a long time because we think it creates huge barriers to opportunity for millions of people, usually the least advantaged. And we're all about eliminating injustices. And in my humble opinion, or someone told me, in my honest opinion, whatever one it is, uh, we think that, and I think that cr the criminal justice system is one of the gravest injustices of our time today. So very happy to be here. Thank you. Um, if each of you, starting with Scott, could talk about the work that you are doing to end money bail and the overall effort around bail reform that each of your organizations is involved in. Sure, I feel like I've sat in the wrong seat. Um, I'm going first, I don't have all the questions. Um, <laughs> no, I um, no. Thank you. First of all, I just want to thank um, you, Malika, especially, but Google overall for um, you know making this decision, having us here today to, to talk about it. Um, I was um, Gina and I were talking earlier about um, how um, great it was to work with you all. You know, I think the maybe the first decision that Google made that led to this obviously is you know pulling in some really um, 
uh, dynamic leaders, you know, you know. Um, so we really just appreciate you all. I think, you know, for us, our work around um, Ending Money Bell started with um, individual stories. Our model at Color of Change is to take the kind of moments um, of um, outrage um, when people see things that are really create dissonance for them and how the world should be working and, 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 it, and it, the injustices seem really clear. Take that energy, um, give people strategic direction to pivot and then scale to systemic changes that we can make. So for us, this work really started with uh, the death of uh, Sandra Bland um, in the Waller County Jail in, um, in, in Texas. And um, you know, most people are very familiar with Sandra's story. Um, people took to the streets all over the country um, in protest. She was pulled over for minor traffic violation. Um, she refused to put her cigarette out while the police officer was talking to her. He basically took offense to that, arrested her. Um, she spent three days in the Waller County Jail and uh, was found um, hanged at the, on the third day. I still dispute in terms of how um, she actually died, but what we did was to send a private investigator to Waller County to try to understand what happened. And you know, the, the thing that came back to us was that there was a very um, um, ugly relationship between the local bail industry, the courts, the jail, um, and so really put um, bail on our radar, but also the role of the industry on our radar. And so we. Um, so we started to talk to our members um, about about the issue, um, and um, also, you know, started to do more research into the industry. And, and last year, we published our report, um, "Selling Off Our Freedom," with the ACLU um, Smart Justice campaign that details um, how the um, how bail works, but also takes a really deep look at the industry. You know, most few folks have an understanding of bail that's shaped by mass media, that bail is kind of just like an automatic thing, um, and um, that folks are, um, the bail bondsmen are, you know, mom, these mom and pop shops, and, and while there are 25,000 bail bondsmen around the country, um, they're backed by these massive global finance companies, surety companies, and about nine companies control about 90% of the $14 um, billion dollars in bail bonds each year. So we've had a real focus on trying to um, educate people about that, but also to isolate the bail bonds industry. That's why we were so excited um, when um, Malika Google came uh, with the thought of, should we be doing this in the same way that we did with, uh, with payday lending? Uh, of course we thought yes, and like, you know, here's our report. <laughs> um, but also, um, it, I, a lot of our effort is to address this, um, this, this, what's happening right now with criminal justice reform, which, uh, Mark alluded to that there are people on both sides of the aisle who really want to see change happen. The folks who are holding on are the people who are profiting and benefiting the most is our analysis. And so we are, our um, efforts to isolate, um, mitigate the, the damage and the resistance to criminal justice reform that we see from folks like the bail bonds industry is really what's driving our work and um, what makes it so exciting for us. So thank you again. Um, so much like what Scott uh, kind of spoke about in terms of color changes involvement um, being tied to stories. Uh, for us at SE, um, it was intuitive to, that this was our issue. Um, women are the ones, today one in four women has a family member who's incarcerated. One in four. And for black women, it's nearly one in two. Um, and for women with incarcerated loved ones, it is this community who is oftentimes making the impossible decisions of, can, you know, should I <laughs> bail someone out? Can I afford to bail someone out? Um, and then living with the, the, I mean, if you can imagine, the devastating kind of psychological impact of not being able to afford um, these incredibly high bail amounts um, or going into debt um, after having bailed someone out. Um, and so for us, this was just our issue. Um, I think about you know, the story of Khalif Browder, which is another, another story that I know brought color of change to the table on this, um, as well as us, is, is something that is a story that really, really hits home. Um, not just because of what happened to Khalif, being incarcerated as a teenager in an adult uh, jail at Rikers, um, spending over a thousand days incarcerated there, being uh, subjected to torture, uh, abuse, uh, humiliation, um, uh, solitary confinement and more, leaving the jail different than he came in. Um, 
and then, and then taking his own life um, because of it. Um, that story, I think, highlighted the issue and made clear for all of us that this is a system that is just um, absolutely antithetical to all of the values that we aspire to. Um, but I think one thing that we, we at ESSE, and certainly none of us should forget, um, is that months later, his mother died. And, uh, and Vanita Browder, uh, as, as the news would say, died of a broken heart. The psychological impact, the emotional, the mental health impact, the, he the physical health impact, the economic impact most certainly, um, is devastating. And this hurts when you can't make bail, it hurts when you can make bail, and that's why we're, that's why we're, we're in, this, uh, in this fight. And, I, and the way that Essie does our work is by organizing women like Vanita. Um, and we, uh, we do that through, uh, we've co-sponsored legislation in California, uh, bail reform legislation. We do that through community uh, education and leadership development. Um, and we also do that through actions. And I hope I'll have a chance to talk a little bit about the Mother's Day bailout actions, but I can also do so now. But talk about it. Yeah, I can talk about it? Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> um, so, well, I'll share with you a little bit about Miss M which is what I'll, what I'll call her today. Um, Ms. M, we met last week um, in a jail in California. Um, by we, I mean community of women who have come through our programs and were trained and, um, and are all women who have had incarcerated loved ones, went to the jail to meet with Ms. M, who's been there since, May, since March 10th, been sitting in a jail cell since March 10th. She, had a, she has a 12-year-old daughter um, and the only reason that she is there, the only reason that she is there was because she couldn't afford her bail, which was $50,000. In California, that is actually equivalent to the average bail amount, um, $50,000. And um, when the women of Essie met with her, they um, pressed their hands up against the glass and they promised her that they were gonna get her out. So they call me up and they're like, we just promised that we were gonna get her out. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I told you not to do that. Um, but you know, so, so it goes. So we, as part of a larger effort, um, with a national bailout effort, which, which uh, Color of Change is also um, one of the leading organizations uh, kind of collaborating to bring together uh, this year over 20 cities um, who will be bailing out black women all, all through Mother's Day, um, is at, we're asking for donations to, to, to bail out women like Miss M. So we did, we started you know, raising that money and we, we were able to get uh, the $50,000 through the national bailout. And the very next day, um, Essie's sisters arrive at the jail with $50,000 in hand to bail her out. She's home today um, because of this effort. And I'll tell you, you know, this is important because it's gonna take everyone. It's gonna take communities leading. But it's gonna take corporations, it's gonna take the private sector, the public sector, politicians, media, everyone. This system is so entrenched, the profit motive is so deep that we really, really need every single person in this room and far, far beyond it to be at the table pushing, coming up with creative ideas like Malika <laughs> saying, hey, you know, maybe we can do something about this um, in order to, to, to really bring people home where they belong. Um, in a places where they have access to uh, health care, to rehabilitation, to education, to job training, and all the things that we know um, is what works when it comes to uh, public safety, um, when it comes to, to thriving economies, um, and so forth. So that is what SE is doing, um, and we're really happy to be, be part of this. Over the last several years, all over the country, Civil Rights Corps has been filing constitutional civil rights cases challenging the American money bail system. And it's really kind of incredible to be invited here today and to see kind of how far we've come. I mean, I remember um, just in 2014, I, I was, for reasons I still don't really know, I was invited to a meeting at the DOJ and I started telling people there that I was gonna start filing lawsuits challenging the money bail system. And everyone was sort of laughing and saying, well, this system is ubiquitous. It's what we do in every single state. Um, in every single courthouse, in every single county, in every single city all over the country, the American money bail system is entrenched, right? I mean, it, it, the for-profit money bail system exists only in the United States and the Philippines, 
Um, but it's very entrenched in both of those places. And, and um, to its credit, actually, um, shortly after we filed the first constitutional challenge in a generation to the American money bail system in, on January 15th of 2015 in a courthouse in Alabama, um, about six weeks later, Vanita and the DOJ filed a landmark statement of interest. And it turned what would have been sort of the crazy theory of a small group of civil rights lawyers into the official position of the United States government. And then from there on, we were able to bring, uh, I think in the first 10 months of 2015, I was involved in 12 class action lawsuits in 12 different cities around the country. And we've been, um, ever since, sort of relentlessly bringing as many of these cases as we can. And the goal, I think, at least the way I think about it, is twofold. The first is to establish a legal principle. And it's a very simple legal principle. I think uh, we're often forced in our court system to make really, really complicated arguments um, that really get at very simple ideas. So we've spilled tens of thousands of pages of ink all over the country, and we've fought really, really hard all the way up to the highest courts of different states and to the federal courts, and all of the cases re really boil down to vindicating a very simple principle, and that principle is that no human being should be put in a cage because she can't make a payment. And it's kind of incredible how simple that is and how when you ask anybody, whether it's uh, someone on the political right or someone on the political left, um, do you agree with that principle? I still really haven't found anybody uh, who, who, who can articulate any reason why someone should be put in a cage because they can't make a payment. And yet, all over the country, we're being fought tooth and nail by the for-profit bail industry, by local judges, by, by um, local um, sheriffs. Um, but one interesting thing is happening. A slow and growing movement of prosecutors, and sheriffs, and police officers, and judges, and defense attorneys, following the lead of people in the community, are starting to change their minds. They're starting to realize there's just no argument that can be made um, against that legal principle that I articulated. So that's the first thing we're trying to do. We're trying to change the law. But the second thing we're trying to do, and I think is much more important, because as you look throughout, and I'm glad Vanita referenced Brian Stevenson's new museum, and lynching memorial in Montgomery, because if you look at it, and one thing that I encourage everyone to go there, because one thing that he, he and, and the rest of the folks at EJI have done so beautifully, is they've captured the line in this country's history from slavery to Jim Crow to the era, in the era of racial terror, right, and, and to the era of mass human caging, predominantly waged against, and disproportionately waged against poor people and people of color. Um, and, and you can see that line. You can see the way it affects the, the, the opportunities available to people. Um, and and, and the, the vital thing that we're trying to do in our cases is not just have a legal victory. You can have a legal victory like Brown versus Board of Education, but 60 years later you can have segregated schools all over the country, right? Because unless you change the underlying culture, the underlying economic incentives, the, the, the way these systems sort of reproduce themselves to, to reproduce the same modes of oppression, then you, you, you can have a, a Pyrrhic victory in court. And courts aren't designed to be agents of social change. So I think we are sort of the rare legal organization made up of litigators that, that actually doesn't really care that much about the litigation. And, 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 and we really care more about bringing the litigation only to the extent it can be part of a social movement that's led by people who are directly impacted. Because it, it's not the, the legal argument that's gonna change the hearts and minds of people, that's gonna resensitize everyone in the legal system and everyone in our culture to the brutality of mass human caging. It's the stories of Sandra Bland and, and Khalif Browder, and it's the stories of, of women like Miss M. Um, and, and so uh, one of the things that we try to do in our cases is use our cases to create a locus for organizing. Um, for telling our clients' story. So it's one thing to say, Your Honor, this person shouldn't be in jail because they can't afford money bail. But it's another thing to, to tell the court, you know, when you put someone in jail because she can't make a payment, here's what happens to them, right? They're, they're exposed to sexual assault, to infectious disease, to terrible food, to filth and squalor, feces, blood, mucus all over the walls and floors of our jail. To describe what it's like to be kept in a cage in 2018 in the richest country in the world where you can't get sunlight or fresh air or hug your child. Imagine, Your Honor, what it would be like if someone came to you and said, you're not permitted to even touch your child for the next few months just because you can't make a monetary payment. It's, it's that human story. It, 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 because what we're trying to do is not just end the money bail system. We ended the money bail system actually in federal courts all over the country several decades ago. And yet, 
72.4% of people charged with federal crimes in this country are detained without bond prior to trial. We're not looking to just get rid of the bail industry and put everyone in jail because, they, because there's, they're detained on no bond. We're trying to end pretrial detention, to end pretrial human caging. And so that's what's so exciting to me about this announcement. It's part of a, it's a symbolic announcement. It's, it's about um, a company, a very powerful company saying, we will not participate in this trafficking of human bodies and human minds. And, and, and that, to me, is what's so exciting for us to be a part of, to be a part of it with people that we look up to and we look to for guidance. Uh, and, and so we're thrilled to be here. And, and I'm happy to answer. I don't know if we have time for it, but if people have questions about the litigation that we've been doing around the country. The final thing I'll say is um, one of the cases we've done that's gotten the most attention is our case in the Harris County Jail. Um, and I'm ha proud to report that as of today, since we won our, our injunction in federal court, 10,500 people have been released from the Harris County Jail uh, since June. Um, so I, I started out talking about removing barriers to opportunity and eliminating injustices. And so we're focused on criminal justice reform in particular because of that. And for us, it's about, first and foremost, public safety. What makes us safer as a society? So you start there. But then we also need to have a system um, that treats everybody the same, regardless of whatever, equal justice under the law. And then we need to have a system of mutual benefit, meaning it works for everybody, and that everybody is kept safe, and that people who are incarcerated are treated better uh, than they are now, um, and that we have rules and laws in place that make sense, and that we have a system that is forgiving and based on redemption and rehabilitation and restoration and not just on warehousing and punitive activities. So for us, there's a whole spectrum of issues in the criminal justice system that need to be fixed. You start with sentencing, or excuse me, let me back up, it, bail. The pretrial stuff is very important, I'm gonna hit that last. But there's all these other reforms going on. Um, and the reality is that these changes have been coming for 10 years now. I think it's being accelerated now. Um, so you see what happened down starting in Texas, and Texas in the last 10 years has closed eight prisons. And I used to get questions from people about, well, what about those people who used to work in the prisons? What's going to happen to them now? And I'd say, well, they're in Texas. They can find another job. But we don't have prisons just to employ people. We have prisons to keep people away who we think are a threat to public safety. So it's a good thing when we have fewer prisons, especially when you see Texas has saved $4 billion with these practices. And it's got a crime rate that hasn't been seen since the mid-1960s. So we're very focused at Coke and in our network on being smart on crime and soft on taxpayers. And so when we talk about bail practices, really, and there's a case from the Supreme Court uh, from the mid-'80s where it says that pretrial detention should be exceedingly limited. Um, it should be the default setting should be liberty. People should be free pending their cases being heard just because they're accused of the crime. And what's happened, though, is, and, and I'm not going to fault any industry or anything else. It's just the way it's worked, all these systems. People haven't paid attention necessarily, and people have defaulted to the amount of money you have as a proxy for public safety. And we know it isn't. So we need to be risk-based and not resource-based in how we decide who gets out after they're arrested. And that's why we're very focused on a lot of common sense reforms that have happened in different states. D.C., as you know, I think it's 90% of the people who are arrested in D.C. are uh, not held on bond. They're set free. And there's very little issues with that. There's very little repeat um, criminal activity. There's not violent activity. So it works. It keeps us safer. And what it does is keep people together and keep families together. And what it does is let people continue to work and be a part of their community. And so we're focused on that. We're focused on smart on crime principles like I talked about. And you talk about a system that needs to be disrupted. It's the criminal justice system. You know, from the 70s and 80s and 90s, we passed a bunch of laws, mandatory minimums, based on fear and emotion, never any data that showed it made us any safer. And now the states are changing that, and hopefully the federal government's going to too. Um, you look at what's happening um, in the states on bail reform based on looking at, is this person a flight risk? Is he a threat to public safety? If they aren't, 
go back to your home, be at home. If you are, then we need to do something different. That's what we need to keep doing. It, it, this whole system needs to be disrupted. And it needs to be disrupted so we can have rules in place that are much more humane, much more sensible, and much more focused on public safety. And there's no way on earth that the amount of money you have is a, pro a proxy for public safety, trust me, but that's the way the system works now and it makes us less safe. We spend $15 billion a year on pre-trial incarceration. That's part of the 80 billion plus we spend on incarceration generally in this country, which is three to four times more per capita than we spend on education in this country. So if you start to look at that and you look at, this is, as you said, we're all said, this is not a left, right, blue, red issue. The Buckeye uh, Institute, a conservative free market think tank in Ohio, has done a study that they'll save at least $70 million a year in Ohio adapting practices that New Jersey has and some of DC has and some other places has have. And the reality is this is a place that's so ripe, the bail pretrial part for technology. You talk about predictive um, programs that can tell who might be a flight risk using those. You talk about monitoring techniques. There's all these different things so we don't have to have people locked up. You know, in the Bill of Rights, the Eighth Amendment talks about bail. And it says bail should not be excessive. And that's been seen as the dollar amount. But there's nothing in the Bill of Rights, really, that's focused on the government's power. As everybody knows, the Bill of Rights is designed to give individuals power against the government. These are your natural rights. So what they were saying, it wasn't celebrating bail. Bail has a function in our system, in our society. I think everyone needs to recognize that at some level. But it should not be the primary way we deal with things. And they were saying as a warning, as a cautionary tale, they'd seen it in their own countries that bail systems have been used arbitrarily to target people, to lock people up without justice. Now, I'm not saying that's happening all the time in our country, but we seem to have drifted towards that. But now we're going the other way, and that's part of a lot of different reforms that are out there now that we think just make a lot of sense. Because when people end up in, in jail for any amount of time, away from their families, they lose their job, they lose their livelihood, they could uh, lose their families, they end up pleading guilty to things they didn't do, then they have a criminal record, they try to get back into society, they can't get a job. There's all this parade of horribles that just is not necessary. And this gets back to what we've been talking about Brian Stevenson, as we always should whenever we're talking about criminal justice reform. As he's absolutely right. We have a two-tiered system. The rich and guilty get a much better deal than the poor and innocent. And it's a pay-to-play system, our whole criminal justice system. If you have resources, you're probably going to be okay. And if you don't, you're going to get run over. So it's very prominent in the bail part of things. That's why that needs to be reformed. But there's also the need for more sentencing reform and prison reform. And I'll make a pitch for a bill that's on the floor, or excuse me, not on the floor, maybe going to judiciary for markup. I know it's probably some folks want more. I want something, and I want something good. And it's the uh, First Chance Act, First Step Act, excuse me. Uh, it's in the House, and it's on prison reform. And the states have had great success in reforming their prison systems. And we need to reform all our systems from beginning to top to end to make them more consistent with the values we have as a country and that are in the Constitution and just basic human civil rights. So we're very excited to be here. We've worked with, Malik is phenomenal, as you all know. We've worked with Google on a number of issues from Ban the Box uh, to the, their last, last summer's amazing um, um, day-long seminar on uh, incarcerated women. And we're very proud to work with you on these issues as well. And we're all about, like I said, breaking down barriers to opportunity and there's a lot out there beyond the prison system, beyond the criminal justice system, and we'll partner with anyone. Charles Koch, who's our CEO, uh, an amazing person, he always, his mantra, his, his hero is Frederick Douglass, and it's, I will unite with anyone to do good and with no one to do harm, and that's where we are on these issues. So thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go to the next panel, I just wanna thank each of you uh, very deeply for your leadership. Uh, your leadership and your commitment to this work and to partnering with us has made this company better. And I am so deeply thankful.
Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sierra. I work at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights, which is an organization that was founded in 1968 to carry on Robert Kennedy's unfinished work for a more just and peaceful world. Um, I'm really honored to be doing, these pan doing this panel with these two, two of very incredible, brave women. Um, so I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourselves, starting with Jessica. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessica Perez. I'm the mother of five children, three of them which are boys who were impacted in different ways by our justice system. Hi, my name is Arvine Knox. I'm with SC Justice Group in Los Angeles. Um, I am a woman who was directly impacted with mass incarceration. Me, myself, being previously incarcerated along with my brother. Um, so I'm here to make sure um, this bail reform happens. Um, and I think on, on the previous panels, we've heard a lot about the, the bail system and the industry. Um, and as, as Alec was saying before, storytelling is important. And I just want to say that we are so, I'm going to ask you to share your stories with us. And we're so grateful that, that you're here and that you have the bravery to do that. Um, so I'll start with you, Jessica. Can, can you describe what happened to your son, Pedro, and um, the impact that not being able to pay his bail really had on, and on you and your whole family. Um, Pedro was a victim not only of uh, excessive bail, but also of police misconduct. Um, when he was sent to Rikers Island at the age of 16, um, they decided to put a bail of $250,000 for reckless endangerment with a weapon. No weapon was ever recovered. He was not the person who they, are, they were looking for. Um, I put in appeals to lower the bail because I felt it was excessive. Um, they denied the appeal in the Bronx County Court. I put in appeal with the appellate division in downtown Manhattan. It was also denied. Um, they were leaving it up to the district attorney to lower his bail. Um, after many months trying to fight for the bail to be reduced so I could be able to bail him out, um, advocates came into place. Um, they alerted the RFK organizations. Um, Google was aware as well. Different people started contacting me. When they researched his case, aside of him being innocent, sent to Rikers Island at the age of 16. Like Alec mentioned, it's a place where you're punished before being found guilty in the courts. You suffer from not, not only inhumane um, living, but police mistreated. My son lost 50% of his vision while in Rikers Island because the way they control a fight in Rikers Island is by macing them with gas. Um, to the point, they throw up blood, and it's just simply unfair. Not only to a 16-year-old, to a young adult, to a father, to a brother. Um, when the RFK looked over his case, um, they decided to post his bail, the whole 250000 as we walked in the court with the check of $250,000, the DA looked back and said he was consenting to reducing the bill to $100,000. <laughs> At that point, my whole year of fight, because I knew it was an excessive bill, was clear that I was being punished for not being wealthy enough and for being of color and of part of a minority groups. So I'm here to ask everyone to please support this because when people of power come into place, they, they, they being heard. And just by them walking in that courtroom, they decided to lower the bell. So it's an example of all this unjust bell reform. Wow, that's awesome. Um, for me, 
I can never forget when that judge looked down at me and told me I was going to give birth in the jail cell. Um, I had no bail. Um, my family came to jail for months, pleading and begging the judge, the deputies, to plead. The bail's bond industry, like, what, is there a bail? Has a bail been set? If so, can we pay it? What can we do? Um, it wasn't until I did almost six months that um, a bail finally came into place. I had found out I was pregnant with my daughter. Well, I found out I was pregnant. I didn't even know at the time it was a boy or a girl. I had horrible health care. Didn't see the doctor regularly. It was a young lady in there who she had miscarried as well. And it was devastating because every day I had to see her and be like, ah, and see a piece of her die every single day. And just pray to God, like, please don't let this be me and my baby. Please let me be able to come home. Like, it's not fair. I had a, a young son at home who wasn't even one. Things you miss that you can't get back that are irreplaceable. And to be told no bail, it's like I'm being held in ransom. I'm being kidnapped. And you're not even giving me a dollar amount. You're not even letting my family, who's pleading with you, begging you, telling you, she's a good girl. She's a good kid. She just got caught up in a bad situation. How can we get her home with her family? Nothing. So after six months of being in there, they finally set a bill of $50,000, which still took my family weeks to raise the 10% of that. Who just has that kind of money sitting around? So it wasn't until we had to come up with the $5,000 that I was able to come home. I had to do four years probation, had to check in every month, pregnant with my child, find out it was a daughter, then toting my son around with me, telling him, this is not the life mommy has for you. This is not going to be your life. That You will never have to scan and check in with any authority. So for bail and me, it's like frustrating because you didn't even give me a bail. But you're making me, you're holding me against my own will and freedom behind something you're accusing me of and you don't have any facts. You don't have any proof. You don't have any evidence that I did it just in that group. And because I don't really know or know I'm not telling anything, you're holding me against and you're punishing me for something. Like I'm punishing my whole family for a mistake. So um, with my brother being incarcerated as well, five years he did for something he didn't commit. The bill was set at a million dollars. Who has $100,000 in cash just floating around like that? And the abuse that he underwent, he broke his hand five times, 12 times, broke his nose, was put into a coma. It was his nomination letter that got me into SC Justice Group that makes me want to fight today. Because prior to that, I, I, I never felt protected. The, the hardship I went through being in there, um, the guards looking at me in a sexual kind of way, I had to do some gruesome things to protect myself so me and my baby wouldn't get molested. I had to show a guard my feces to make him think I was crazy so me and my child wouldn't be harmed. But this is supposed to protect and serve. This is justice, and it's not. Yeah, and I think that, um, thank you, both of you, for that, first of all. Um, and I, I think most folks don't know you know, many folks in America don't know about the bail system, won't experience, direct, won't experience it directly, won't experience incarceration directly. So what, what do people need to know about what each of your families went through and what you went through? And maybe you can describe for folks just some of the things like, what is it like to go and visit your teenage son who's been in jail for over a year, um, who has brothers and sisters, um, and, and what is it like for you with your brother or you inside? And, and just give, give folks some, a sense of that. Um, when a loved one is put away in jail, it doesn't affect only that person, whether it's a child or an adult. It affects a whole family. If it's a child, like um, Sierra mentioned, it has siblings, a mother, a father, has to work, have to take out time off their job to spend at least five hours just for an hour visit, sometimes a half an hour visit, because that's the process in Rikers Island. Aside of spending five hours, you gotta undergo searches such with canine, such strip search, which I call sexual, because they have to touch you in certain places 
or they claim they have to do it. But mind me, you're not a criminal. That's one. The person who are you, you visiting is still not sentenced. And even if that person is guilty of a crime, nobody should be going through a shame while pending a criminal proceeding. Because this is all while pending a criminal proceeding. So I'm going to give you a, a little example of what my family had to undergo. I have a 15-year-old son, um, Catholic school. He's raised with manners. Yes, sir. No, sir. Um, going to Rikers Island, he felt empowered. He felt he couldn't speak up. He felt he couldn't say, why are you doing this to me? Because do that, he's six foot tall, even though he's 15. He was asked to put his pants down to show his privates, to make sure he wasn't bringing in drugs, like they say. Um, he stopped visiting his brother. That was the last time he went, because he said he wasn't going to let them. Um, what was the word he used? I'm not going to let them turn me into something I'm not. I have rights, and because I have rights, I'm not going to let them do this to me, just to see my brother. I'll write him. I'll speak to him on the phone, but I'm not visiting this place again. Um, I have a four-year-old, which is five now. Um, in order for me to visit my son, after a long day, I was asked to go through her underwears to make sure she didn't have nothing inside of her underwears. When I declined to do it, I say, I'm not doing that. She said, so then you have to leave. You're not going to be able to see your son. It was a Saturday. The next visit would be a Thursday. So my 17-year-old would have to stay with our visit, which is the only thing those inmate has to get out of those cells. It's that one hour in that floor with their family to give them support, to give them hope that they're going to come home. I was forced. I didn't, at the moment, I didn't have an option. So I had to check my daughter. To this day, now I'm speaking to a five-year-old that not all cops are bad, that not everyone is bad, because she fears cops when cops are there to serve and protect. Now she fears them at the age of five years old. So I'm here to give voice to the voiceless. I'm here to give voice to the other mothers who are going through the same thing in my community. My son is not the only one that spent a year in Rikers. My son is just one of thousands who are put in Rikers Island and in many jails just because they can't afford an excessive bail in many cases. And in my son's case, he was innocent all along. So that's why I said he was a victim twice, not only of the excessive bail, but of police misconduct. But aside of Khalif Browder's story, may he rest in peace, and his mother as well, I believe if we speak out and everybody gets together, we could make a change. And this bail reform would definitely happen. For me, I feel like my son's famous quote is, if you don't know something, Google it. And with that and what we're going through, it's bigger than just Googling it. It takes real life experience. It takes stories like your story, my son's story. It takes stories like Cleve Brown and his mother. It takes stories like my story and my family and all the women across the world who are going through the same thing, who feel isolated, who feel like they don't have a voice. It's our duty to let them know that we're here, we support them, we love you, and you're not alone in this fight. And with the bail industry at the peak right now, it's like they're raping us, they're taking our tax dollars, they're taking what little income we do have to provide for our family. Now we have to put up our homes and our property as collateral just to get out. So it's like, for us being here today, it's, it's a place where now you're, you're educated, you've learned something that you didn't know before about a certain situation and it's your voice and you as influencers to make that happen, to make that change, to stand up for it and be like, no, we're gonna fight this head on and we don't agree with it. So to be here today at Google is, for me, 
I wasn't expecting this. I was like, wow, little old me, why, for what? But it's bigger than that. And I get that and I respect that. Thank you, Malika, again for having us. And I just, um, we demand the change. And with us demanding it, and we all come united, we'll get it. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your stories and for the work that you're doing to drive this movement forward. Um, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I know folks have questions, so we want to formally close. And those who want to stay for questions, you are welcome to do that. We have this room till 12 o'clock. So please, uh, if you have questions, please stay. But we wanted to close out with, uh, with a short doc that Google did on Rikers. And this was really the beginning of our commitment to looking at the issue of bail reform. In July, four of our vice presidents went to Rikers. We have three different office buildings in New York. And it's important as Google has that kind of presence in New York that we understood what was happening at Rikers. So leadership went and did a tour of Rikers uh, and had an opportunity to be able to bear witness to what Rikers is and to understand that 80% of those at Rikers are unconvicted and that so many folks are there because they cannot afford their bail. Individuals like Khalif Browder, like Pedro, and so Part of the visit was then also to be able to do a short doc to tell the stories of individuals whose loved ones are at Rikers because they could not afford jail, and individuals themselves who served time at Rikers because they could not afford bail. I want to close with that. I want to thank everybody for being here, and I want to urge that we continue to be in this partnership around addressing and ending mass incarceration. Thanks. Remember like it was yesterday. Being sarcastic because the guard told me that welcome to Vietnam. And I said verbatim, I never signed up for the draft. I remember them taking me to unit one. They beat me so bad that I didn't even remember what happened or where I was until 90 days later. Rikers is a nightmare. Rikers is dangerous. Sadness. Full of hate. Rikers is a black hole. Rikers is humbling. Lawless too. I hated it. I hate, I hate that place. On any given day, Rikers Island Jail in New York City confines nearly 8,000 people. Conditions on the island are brutal, horrific, worse than most prisons where inmates serve long sentences after a conviction. But Rikers is a jail where 80% of the people locked up are awaiting their day in court and have not been convicted of a crime. They are innocent in the eyes of the law. These are the stories of the men, women, and family members who endured and survived Rikers Island. You know, everybody has a story. Everybody has a, a walk that impacts their thinking. Going to Rikers Island, going over that bridge feels like one of the, the longest bridges you know, I ever took in my life. Going across the bridge, all you hear was that the CEO was telling you, welcome to Gladiator School, welcome to The Rock. So you get a, you know, a mental image of what to expect when you get there, but it's nothing like when you really get there. One in three detainees at Rikers is there because they have been charged with misdemeanors, which are low-level crimes. 
But investigations into Rikers Island recently have found many human rights violations, including unnecessary and excessive force by corrections officers, sexual abuse and assault of female detainees by male guards, and widespread violations of the civil rights of teenagers. 15 years old, my innocence was raw for me. You know, before that, I was this student that graduated, uh, went to South Africa in first year of college. He got the United Nations Gift of Giving Award, and he's got all these things going for him. And now I'm here in jail. How did that happen? And, I mean, addictions are addictions, and things happen. Even though he was charged with a crime, my son was never a criminal. He never had a criminal record at all. But he learned how to understand criminal mind and how to um, survive, pretty much, in there. Well, what happens is a lot of times you are subjected to getting raped in the bathroom. I, I, had, I had to have um, survival sex in the bathroom. I wasn't even scared. I just, I felt helpless. Like, I didn't know what to do. That's when I really realized, like, you only own an island. Andrew went into Arrakis with stage four cancer when he got in there. But they wasn't able to give him the medication he needed due to it being very expensive. So my phone calls were painful because every day he was calling crying, he was in pain. I went to visit my son. My son was bed, bugs, bitten all over him. He was deteriorating every day in jail. And that, as a mom, worst feeling ever. And as I think about it now, I still get angry. Still, the number one story that really bothers me is them walking around while we're going to the bathroom, knowing that we're going to the bathroom and kind of standing there staring in the window at you. And it wasn't just me that they did that to, they did it to a lot of us. Essentially, he could do whatever he wanted to, and he could make you feel less than a woman, basically. You definitely felt sexually exploited. In 2015, New York City found that 1,500 men and women on Rikers had waited more than a year for their trial. That's over 700 days of violence, over 700 days of dreams deferred, over 700 days for innocence to be lost. Many feel trapped, and so they plead guilty before ever having their day in court. My son ended up staying in Rikers Island for six years, waiting for trial. He thought that he was gonna die there. I knew that taking a plea wasn't gonna be my key to freedom, but I knew it was my key out of Rikers Island, which was the only freedom that mattered to me at that point. I said, I don't care, just get me out of here. I will cop out to anything just to go. I'm still with the trauma. Trauma is real. I don't care what nobody said, trauma is real. Any little thing to pop back in your head and take you back to that one place that you hated the most. Not only did they took my child, but they took my faith in the system and my son is dead. And I didn't get my last years with him. So I have my days, but I keep moving. This is the new me. Ten years of waiting to close Rikers means ten years of more dreams deferred. I have seen how Rikers Island has destroyed communities. I've seen how people come back to the Bronx and come back to communities all across the city, and they're different, and they are changed, and they are, they are fearful, and they're hesitant to go and walk down the block, and they, they look at, at parole officers and the regular cops and the, the community in a different way. How do we allow this to continue? 